Did any of the rest of you kind of start to have ideas about how this kind of research collectively into digital place making might become more like of an activist kind of kind of kind of gesture or set of acts or set of interventions and and what was the and what was the sort of and how did you how did you feel the potential for that uh, Rosanna A lot of my work was thinking about yeah initially very kind of uh very much thinking about like the digital infrastructures that are in public space and how um, young black and POC kind of creatives could actually hack those layers and and what would that mean Um, and that led me into quite a deep dive kind of exploration I guess of 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 Instagram uh, and specifically thinking about that space um, as a space of of activism and of course that has you know in the last few months that whole uh, situation around that with the uh, Black Lives Matter uprisings of this year which have really kind of uh, turned it turned the dial right up basically on on all of these aspects that I'd started to explore Um, it's been really incredible to think about that platform as a site of activism as a site of also commodification of activism and performance of activism and therefore what does it mean when actually we've had enough of those spaces and we no longer see ourselves being able to put our our whole selves onto into those spaces and so that has caused me to shift entirely my research over the last you know few months of of lockdown and actually thinking much much more deeply about what a physical and or digital space might look like that actually nourishes, that takes care, that is uh, centred around the experiences of being whole as a person of colour in digital space and, and what that means to collectively care for each other in that kind of space in a way that our existing platforms just don't, uh, don't facilitate. It's a really interesting idea. This this idea of um, making physical digital spaces for for rest or for centering care. I really I really like that idea. It makes me think of something I was reading the other day about um, about black power naps um, and their their project, which I which I think is um, is is a really entertaining and um, and critical project. Um, uh, but but I was also thinking about um, I was thinking about uh, an interview I was listening to the other day um, with um, Franco Bifo Baradi, um, in which he was he was talking about blacking out the white noise of the infosphere and creating the conditions for silence, um, and he's coming in a way out of thinking about Occupy, and he's talking about um, well he's suggesting in a way that it's that it's it's now not productive to occupy occupy the streets and that instead we need to reoccupy our bodies um, and our locations um, and that we need to occupy the digital um, layers. We need to um, occupy our our communities of interest. We need to rec- reclaim our communities of interest and our reclaim our desires and our attentions and, and resist their their extraction. So he's he's proposing something a little bit similar. He's in a sense suggesting that we we try to make a space um, that, that we can occupy or our communicate communities can occupy um, that is outside of the reach I guess of, of data e- extraction um, and that, that we should should find we should create the conditions for silence and for silence um, from the, that's that's beyond the excess of information that we're we're dealing with day to day but I think um, what he also missed is in, in, in what he's saying uh, and that comes back to Rosanna what you were doing earlier on really in your research project I think what he, he misses is also the need to take up digital space and the issues are around um, the, the way that digital spaces or hybrid spaces have the potential to reproduce existing inequities um, and reproduce um, the foregrounding of, of voices that are already privileged and, and well represented presented and that in fact we we do also need to think about those digital spaces of as 
spaces in which underrepresented voices um, uh, can can be um, published and um, and uh, that that uh, other cultures can can be represented and we need to we need to consider that also. So this was where my research led into just as Will described this fantastic conversation that he was having with somebody who was in a position of influence and power. Just as as we're hearing that having spaces to rest and take care of ourselves, but also you know, having these conversations, uh, having our voices in the space. And this is something that we picked up very uh, early on in this, in the the fellowship discussions, was that some some of us were arriving with a sense that to have our voice um, included or to have space made for us was in itself going to uh, be the thing that was necessary. But there then also becomes the issue that actually how are we then safe in that space? because just getting our voice into the space isn't enough. So in an essay I wrote about my research, um, I'll talk about, uh, and it's an installation in a place in Bath where they had like a a summer installation. So there was like pims and football or or tennis and there was, I'm I'm not very good at it as you can tell, there was some kind of a sporting event on on a large screen, that's all I know. And you know, it, it was supposed to rest and kind of have playfulness in the city. But, and it was, arguably wheelchair accessible. But as a disabled woman, I did not feel safe in that space. It was not accessible to me because, you know, I come from a background in which uh, CCTV is regularly used from supermarkets to prove that disabled people aren't disabled and don't need benefits, don't need benefits. That austerity has a huge amount of um, surveillance over people and so have geotagged photographs. So the idea of your occupation of uh, your Instagram or your occupation of being on a, a deck chair in Bath or next to a deck chair in the summer having strawberries um, can actually be used, be weaponized against you. So when we're looking at playful cities, when we're looking at engaging, when we're looking at inclusion of voices, how are we sure that our voices are actually safe in there? Because all too often I feel like, like people ask our voices to go there because they know that they're missing. And I'm thinking, yeah, but you haven't actually done any work to make the space safe. We're not there just because nobody thought to invite us. It's a little more complicated than that. Actually, what you're trying to do at that point to me is put me there so that your life looks like a Benetton catalogue but I'm actually going to be at risk in that space for you to feel like you're not racist or you're not ableist or you're not sexist and I'm not willing to risk my disabled queer body for you to feel happier about your lack of prejudice when actually you are very prejudiced but then we're into well actually how do we have those conversations in a way that's safe which came into a piece of research called the anatomy of conversation where we take psychotherapeutic principles to actually uh, democratise the uh, the the psychotherapic way of working and to break down how do we assess appetite how do we assess aptitude how do we influence in a way that's effective but in a way that doesn't damage or cost us as marginalized individuals speaking truth to power in what is still often an incredibly dominant space